Jeffrey, I was really taken with an article that you wrote for Quillette called The Neurodiversity Case for Free Speech. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, if you could just kind of outline the case that you made in that piece, and I'd love to talk to you about it. I mean, the piece was inspired, honestly, by the James Damore fiasco with Google, right, where this lovely Aspie programmer, Damore, is trying to approach Google, his company, saying, I think you guys are doing certain things wrong and getting certain, uh, certain policy issues wrong about sex differences and why there's certain inequalities of outcome. And he got hammered, absolutely hammered, even though he tried to express his concerns as systematically and logically as possible, right? And Google basically said, you can be systematic and logical, but we are offended. This is outrageous. You're bad. We're going to fire you. And then I looked at my own university's speech codes, our own policies about what you're allowed to say. And they basically were full of language that said, don't be offensive. Don't be outrageous. Try to anticipate how people will react. And as someone with Asperger's myself, who has trouble with that, right, where I don't always understand other people's beliefs and desires as easily as, as normies do, I thought, how the hell am I supposed to know what is going to cause offense or what will cause outrage? That's a totally subjective judgment. So if you're putting the onus on someone with Asperger's or any other kind of neurodiversity to kind of interpret a speech code, and to, to basic, you're basically asking everyone to acquire a telepathy superpower. To know automatically, before I say something, what will cause offense and not to say that. And I thought, particularly at a university, that is a ludicrous and oppressive attitude to take because there are a lot of Aspies at university, right? They're overrepresented in science, technology, engineering, math, um, and in psychology. So you're basically asking academics, don't have the kind of personality that leads you to become an academic, and instead download this telepathy superpower that will allow you to navigate this PC minefield. So this also applies to some of the kind of aftermath of the Me Too, because now in many areas what's being said is that we can't have any unwanted sexual attention you're asking someone to then know exactly what unwanted sexual attention is. Yeah, so to the extent that men tend to initiate sexual attention and women sort of react to it, you're basically putting the onus on young men to somehow understand which woman will be receptive to, you know, courtship under what circumstances. And that's, a, that's one of the very hardest problems for young men to figure out with, with the male brain. It's even, you know, it's doubly, triply hard if that young man has Asperger's or any of a number of other mental disorders or personality variants. And I, I don't think it's, it's sort of fair in a moral or, or legal sense to say you have to be a mind reader. You have to acquire this telepathy superpower. And if you don't, you should not participate in the mating market at all. And that's the message a lot of young men on college campuses are getting. This is what I hear again and again in office hours and classes, is young men saying, I am terrified to even try to date any woman on campus because I don't know what the rules are. And if I make a single misstep, I can be thrown out, expelled, you know, lose uh, lose my fellowship, my grant, lose my college degree, basically for an innocent error of, of, of misunderstanding. What I find really interesting about this argument is that it, it, it is actually very inclusive. It's actually kind of often what comes in with this sort of censoriousness of the kind of the more extreme social justice left is this sort of sense of thou shalt not but what you're saying is that that censoriousness itself is discriminatory against people who don't see the world in the same way as the people making the rules. Yeah, the irony is the social justice left say everyone must be treated equally, you know, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, 
sex. Oh, except if you have any form of neurodiversity, that means you're a little bit socially awkward or overly assertive or overly argumentative, then you should be expelled. You should be ostracized, stigmatized. Your life should be ruined. There is no place for you in our culture. And that's an incredibly unwelcoming, you know, divisive, uninclusive attitude to have, to act like everybody is expected to know these sort of sensitivity rules at all times. And have you seen that happen in your campus specifically? I've seen it happen a lot and, and yet it doesn't happen quite as much as you think. Why? Because young men in particular learn to self-censor. Like they learn really quickly, oh my God, if I'm taking human sexuality class, there's a lot of questions I should not ask because 70% of the students are female and a lot of them will give me pretty nasty looks if I raise certain issues. So what you end up actually seeing in, in like my classes is the only guys who are willing to speak up are basically the mature students, like the granddad who's coming back to college age 65 and is just curious to learn stuff, um, or the vets, right? They've served two tours in Afghanistan, they've come back, they don't give a shit, they'll say whatever they want. Um, but the young men who are 19, who don't have those life experiences and who have a lot more to lose, are incredibly self-censoring. And you can hear it in their voices, the, the fear with which they approach a lot of these topics. And this, is, this reminds me a bit of um, Eric Weinstein in an interview that we put out, a documentary put out called Glitch in the Matrix 2, The Origin of the Intellectual Dark Web, was that this, these sort of tales of the distribution, the kind of the really obnoxious or the really difficult people are often where the genius comes from. Yeah, I mean, where would civilization be without guys who have Asperger's? You, you would lose literally about 90% of all the major technical and social innovations that have happened in the last several thousand years. So if you shut down the Aspies, Right? What you would have shut down would have been like the entire Apollo program, the entire tech industry, um, the entire industrial revolution, the entirety of science, um, most of medicine, all lost. If you censor um, people who show all kinds of freaking neurodiversity. And it's not just Asperger's. There's also people with kind of light forms of schizophrenia called schizotypy who sort of have like weird beliefs and are eccentric and have, have strange views of the world. Um, even people who are a little bit sociopathic or psychopathic can contribute amazingly to society if they learn to harness their particular strengths and weaknesses in kind of pro-social ways. So if you only want the kind of normies to contribute to society, like you could do that, but good luck sustaining and advancing in civilization on that basis. And as you said in the piece, there's a kind of paradox of wanting to respect diversity, but actually what you insist on is a kind of homogen homogeneity of different personality types. Yeah, you're homogenizing personality traits. And you know, when I, like, I've written a bit on, on mental illnesses, but almost everybody who, who is serious in psychology knows there's kind of a continuum between, quote, normal and personality variants and personality disorders and light mental illnesses and then like low functioning serious mental illnesses. And, you know, Asperger's is kind of on a continuum with autism. Maybe it's kind of on under debate. Um, Schizotypy is kind of on a continuum with schizophrenia. Sociopathy is kind of on a continuum with psychopathy. But it's a big mess and nobody really understands the variation. The point is, there is variation. It does matter. It particularly matters in social interaction and communication and trying to take other people's perspectives. So if you have a social justice left that's saying everybody must be exactly equally sensitive and abil 
and able to anticipate any possible discomfort or offense or outrage, they're basically silencing the majority of people in society. Do you think that's more applicable to universities than elsewhere? And especially at universities, right? Universities are kind of a continuation of, of medieval monasteries where all the freaks and weirdos and nerds and eccentrics hung out. You know, that's why they became monks and were like, let's all get together and do like calligraphy and worship God and whatever. Universities used to be a sanctuary for the unusual and the eccentric. And I think they still should be. But if you let them get taken over by the, the censorious social justice left, then universities lose their whole reason for being. And, and like, then where do the eccentrics go? Well, they're going to go onto YouTube and be a lot less quiet about their weird beliefs. And what about, I know you wrote quite a bit about the James Damore case. What was it in particular that exercised you about that? Because <clears throat> here was a well-intentioned, bright... Did you identify with him? I identified quite a bit with him. I, I thought, like, if I was younger and I'd gone into the tech industry I, and I had kind of his similar libertarian politics, I could totally imagine that kind of thing happening to me. Where I go, well, Google, you're not being very logical about this sex differences issue. Here's how I think you could do better constructively, right? And he took such pains to express himself in constructive ways and to footnote and to like link to the scientific literature and nobody cared. They were just like, we don't like your message. You're a bad person. You deserve to be burned at the stake or the modern equivalent, which in some ways is actually worse. Um, so yeah, I identified pretty strongly with him and, and you know, reached out and tried to be supportive. And my worry is there are literally hundreds of thousands of other young people of both sexes like him working in tech and other industries who are now operating in a state of complete terror and, and aren't sure what they can say under what circumstances and where the companies they work for are doing a continual bait and switch where it's like, we welcome your input. Please be radically honest. Please let us know how we can improve our goods and services and improve our internal HR procedures. And then these people will sp like take the bait and speak up and then be hammered. It's kind of like when Mao in the 60s, early 60s said, let a thousand flowers bloom. We're going to have an intellectual renaissance. Everybody say what you really think. But all they were really doing is gathering information about who to crush in the Cultural Revolution. And I mean, the other part of the James Damore situation was the fact that the, the media was very... I think there was, a, there was an article by Connor Frieders, Friersdorf in The Atlantic where he said something like, he's never seen a document that was so publicly available to so many journalists mischaracterized so much. And I think, yeah, he, he basically said that was, a, that was a unique situation and it was a collective failure on behalf of of the media to, to construe it as an anti-diversity screed mm -hmm. when James Damore specifically framed it as these are ways that we could increase a gender diversity in the workplace. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it was also a turning point in realizing that journalists do not generally have the professional ethos to do journalism, at least not in America, not anymore. Before that, I kind of sort of trusted journalists to get it right mostly because I'd interacted with science journalists. And science journalists generally are good, smart, and honorable people who try to get the science reporting right. But oh my god, once you go outside that, that bubble and you get into kind of general journalism, clickbait journalism, Vox.com, uh, all of that stuff, then you know, I don't think it was a failure of journalism to read the Demore piece. I think they intentionally um, either read it and mischaracterized it, or knew that, well, if we read it, it might soften the reporting, so we're not even going to engage with what he said. This is um, crucifixion time, right? This is the time to do our virtue signaling and to tell the world um, 
not just this is a bad man, but to set the social norm that says, and furthermore, all of you other motherfuckers out there with this condition, don't you dare say anything even close to this, because we will ruin your life also. And what do you think it says about the, the current kind of culture of the media that it was mischaracterized that, that way? Um, I think it shows that most journalists now aren't journalists, they're activists. And they don't really care about the truth, they care about spinning their particular narrative. And they will sacrifice the truth very eagerly to, to promote that narrative. So if they have a certain you know, role of evilness that they want to fit you into, they will fit you in there regardless of, of whether you really belong there or not. And I think we saw this over and over and over after Damore with, you know, Trump and with the reaction to everybody who even sounded like they might vaguely support Trump or with Brexit and everybody who sounded like they might even vaguely be sympathetic to Brexit. Um, and so I realized we're not really living in a, in a free speech society. Uh, we're living in a hegemony where journalists are doing this, this ideological instruction and ideological capture. And the only zones for freedom are the kind of IDW stuff or what you guys are doing. YouTube, I hope, I hope YouTube stays relatively free. And I mean, what a, again, sort of coming back to the neurodiversity argument, what I really love about that is that it reframes this ideological capture of the media as well. Did you get much pickup from it? Have you seen that argument getting much traction? Because it does seem that it's a very effective argument against the, the exclusion of certain voices in the media landscape. Yeah. I think my neurodiversity piece got almost no traction precisely because it was a really good argument. I think it would have been extremely awkward for journalists who read it, and I know some read it, to go, oh my God, the guy's right. Existing speech codes are discriminatory. Um, I even did a follow-up piece called The Cultural Diversity Case for Free Speech that was about how do you create, let's say, campus policies that are genuinely welcoming to grad students or faculty from other cultures, Brazil, China, Iraq, Japan, whatever. How do they come to America and actually learn what they're allowed to say? Um, can we perhaps provide a list of taboo topics that they can avoid? Um, can we give them good training for how to engage with American political arguments where it's like, okay, here, here are the, the views that American society generally holds, but here are the views on campus that you're only allowed to hold. And that also I thought was a powerful argument. Um, it was also inclusive, it was pro-diversity. It's like, we should have grad students from other cultures. We just shouldn't have a bait and switch where we go, we're a free society, oh wait, but not about this issue. Because this is the paradox of the social justice left as well, is that they love marginalized people, poor people in the abstract, but they actually hate their views. Yeah, and it gets them into such awkward corners, it's almost hilarious. Like if you're teaching a human sexuality class and talking about mate choice, and then maybe you have a young Indian woman in the audience say, I'm married. Actually, it was an arranged marriage. My parents found my husband for him. I didn't meet him until the day of the wedding. And you know what? We're really happy. The American women can't even process that. Like, you're patriarchally oppressed because it was arranged, but you're happy, so it's okay. So, like, it's a pseudo-diversity pseudo they want. They don't actually want people from different cultures and lifestyles and mating conditions to actually speak up about their experience. They want to just impose their little worldview on everything that happens. And to the extent that, you know, a student from India kind of buys into what they want, then like you're an honorary American leftist and that's okay. But if someone actually challenges what they're saying, um, a, their first instinct is ostracism and silencing, and B, they have no logical argument against a different culture. You see this quite a lot with 
the reaction to Coleman Hughes, who's written quite a few pieces for Quillette. There's sort of this unspoken deal in these kind of social justice subcultures, which is, as a person of colour, you play a certain role and we will give you a, a hierarchical position, but that role is to make us feel guilty about our white privilege, it is to kind of to fit into a certain narrative. And, and there's a kind of devil's bargain there with, with the, the people going into it, but if that person refuses to play that game, like Coleman Hughes, for example, with his piece about Quillette, saying there are cultural reasons for black failure that are not entirely due to racism, for example, he, they don't know what to do with it. They're, they're someone, as soon as someone comes, slips out of the script, it, it's a very different conversation, and no one really knows how to react. Yeah, and, th and that again you know, illustrates that social justice left pays a lot of lip service to diversity, but they, they aren't actually capable of processing anybody with a kind of complicated patchwork of views. You know, maybe we, we should step back from it and say maybe we don't want the social norms of communication to be set by a bunch of absurdly immature 18-year-olds. Like maybe they should actually respect people who have a little more life experience um, instead of thinking, well, if it feels wrong to me, I should protest it and, and shut them down. <laughs>